to the glory of God the Father. He's, he's the only one. There is no other like him. And as Joshua pointed out, the fact that Herod would hear of the miracle ministry of Jesus and think it was John the Baptist come back from the dead tells you how little Herod knew of him. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 6. We're picking up where we left off last week where Jesus had sent out the disciples two by two. Amazing things happened by the power of God vested upon them, that derived power. And so surely when, when think about it, when the exponential expanse of the ministry of Jesus where before he was moving into towns, the twelve were, were following him and observing him and learning from him, now he sends out six units of an extension of him. And word begins to travel much quicker as the impact is extended much farther. And we read a passage today if you've, if you've found Mark 6 verses 14 to 29 would stand with me. If you don't have your Bible, though I, I really urge you to read it from your own Bible. If you don't have a Bible and want one, see me. We'll get you one. We have it on the screens though in case you found yourself here today without your personal copy of the Word of God. Follow along as I read Mark 6, 14 to 29. It's going to sound very familiar to what we read together from Matthew a few moments ago. King Herod heard of it, that is he heard, heard of all these miracles being performed. For Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. Others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders, the, the rank given here in the Greek, these were, these were like brigadier generals, and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. She came immediately with haste to the king saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This account from God's Word, we just read what? The inerrant, inspired, all-sufficient Word of God. What a terrible story. Yes, it must be told so that we understand the ultimate cost of being identified with Jesus. Thank you. Please be seated. This story of the death of John the Baptist is uh, it's tragic on many levels. The manner in which he died is gruesome. 
And thanks to the savagery of ISIS. The Islamic State in Iraq and Syria is not something we have to imagine. Some of you may have actually summoned up whatever it takes and viewed the videos online of people being beheaded. Maybe you've seen the pictures of Christians being crucified. No, this savagery is not a distant problem. It is near us today. Beheading is a bloodthirsty brutality. And the occasion for the death of the Baptist is that a spineless king cannot control his lusts and allows himself to be manipulated by a provocative teenage exotic dancer. The motive or the reason behind his sudden untimely death is that he had dared to preach truth to power rather than see repentance come, which is what he desired, he experienced revenge. And the story is told here. We must remember when we read through it that Jesus' commentary on John was that one greater than Elijah is here. In fact, he would say that there's no one born of woman who exceeds and excels John the Baptist. We know from the narratives that he was a cousin to Jesus. That he first, I'll put this in quotes, met Jesus when Mary went to visit Elizabeth who was about six months pregnant with John in her womb and Elizabeth told Mary, when my child heard the voice of the mother of my Lord, he leaped within me. We don't know how much time they would have spent together as cousins growing up. We're not told anything about that, but we do know that John the Baptist bursts on the scene in the Gospels, having lived among the Essene community, a uh, almost monastery-like group of a very, very monk-like people who would take vows of poverty and vows of chastity and, and would deprive themselves of many of life's comforts in order to work on full devotion to God, to Yahweh. And we're told of his strange eating habits and his strange uh, wardrobe. He would eat wild honey and locusts and dressed in animal's hair. We see in John the Baptist a bold man. I want us to just draw out of this text for a few minutes today some three, three considerations. First of all, that Herod becomes alarmed over Jesus' ministry. We'll look at that, verses 14 to 16. Then Herod was responsible for John's imprisonment, uh, verse 17 to 20. And then thirdly, Herod allows himself to be tricked into executing John, verses 21 to 29. Matthew says he wanted to. Mark says he struggled about it. We understand when we read the text, the combined text, that he put him in prison to silence him, even though when he heard John preach, John had words of life in the midst of his challenges to repentance. Look at, just real quickly, at Luke 3, 19 to 20, which was a little more light on this. It tells us when Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him, that is by John the Baptist, for Herodias, for, for taking Herodias. You see, the law was that, that he could have married his brother's wife had his, had his brother deceased, but his brother was still alive. And it was improper for Herod to take his brother's wife from him. What we find out as you, as you go into the backstory of all this, do some digging in, the, in some of the materials available, is that, that his brother's wife... I mean, his brother was a private citizen. He was, he was not a powerful man. Now, he came from a powerful family, to be sure, but, but Herod is a, is a tetrarch. He's, he's, the, he's got one of four 
people who had Herod the Great's kingdom divided up among them. And so he had power. He is, he is Herod Antipas. He is, the, he is the Herod who, when he got news from the wise men that the Messiah was being born, sent his soldiers to slaughter all boy babies two years old and under. Remember that Rama wept and would not be consoled. For so many boys, so much future being slaughtered. This is Herod the Tetrarch and, and other evil things Luke says that he had done but added to this, this to them all he locked up John in prison Luke says. To silence John the Baptist. Parenthetically why do we call him John the Baptist? I, I actually saw when I was in Louisiana was driving down a road one day and there was a, John the Baptist Catholic Church. That always intrigued me. I had the opportunity at one point to share responsibilities in a funeral with the young priest of John the Baptist Catholic Church. And we had an interesting conversation about that name. All he would say was, that was the name of the church when I came. We call him John the Baptist because he's, he's identified as the immerser, the baptizo guy. He steps into the waters of the Jordan or wherever he was and summons people to repent of their sins and prove your repentance with fruit showing you're turning from wicked ways and come and identify with righteousness by coming into the water, letting me immerse you, baptizo you. We don't call him John the Baptist because he was, quote, the first Baptist. That's what some would like for you to believe, but he was identified. I, I happen to believe had he been alive today, he would join a Baptist church, but that's just because he's, a, he's an immersionist. He believes in, in immersing disciples, you know. But that's why we call him that. Furthermore, in Luke 9, 7 to 9, now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening and he was perplexed because he'd said, it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. And Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. So we get a little bit of the flavor of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and their narratives about this. I want us to look though at these three, three considerations. Herod became alarmed over Jesus' ministry, verses 14 to 16, he, he heard of it. The, the news expands. He's been hearing, he's been hearing about this, this rabbi moving through the country, coming through Galilee, and he's healing people, and he's teaching like no one's ever taught. And he manifests a wisdom and a power, and he's wondering, who, who is this? And Well, they would tell him, it's Jesus of Nazareth. That, that, who, that, who is he, though? Well, he began to be concerned. He, didn't want, he did not really want to have John beheaded in the first place. Now he thinks he's come back to life. And I'm about to have a terrible time of it. Otherwise, if he was not someone come back from the dead, Herod, Herod reasoned, he couldn't do these miraculous powers. In other words, God's raised John from the dead and has anointed him with the miraculous powers. And I'm going to be in trouble. Others tried to calm him down. So, well, he's Elijah. There's other, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But, but Herod, no. John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. The, so what do we learn from this? That the influence of Jesus as he sends out the 12, two by two, is expanding exponentially and, and more and more is becoming known of him. More and more people are becoming aware that there's a movement in the area, in the region, that is attended by miraculous signs, attended by the exorcism of demons, the sick healed, a powerful message brought. You know good and well the disciples brought the same message that Jesus did. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So now that it's spreading and it's, you're not just hearing it from this corner, you're hearing it from over here. Uh, 
Herod's alarmed. The son of Herod the Great, the Tetrarch of Galilee, Gal Galilee and Perea, east of the Jordan. It, the area between the, the uh, Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, that was his region. He ruled a fourth of that region. Took his title of king because Tetrarch is a little anemic, just a, a leader over a portion of a king's territory. He's concerned and rightly so because miracles are being performed. And so at this point, Mark wants to tell us the back story rather than just, he's, he said in Mark chapter 1 verse 14, and Herod had John arrested. You, you just hear that and he's moving on. So he wants to tell us more. He wants us to understand what would be significant about this event, about Herod's misunderstanding what was going on. So in the uh, second thing, we see that Herod was responsible for John's imprisonment. Look at verses 17 to 20 real quickly. It was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in a prison for the sake of Herodias. She was after him. You heard what the man said. I mean, he stood outside the palace within our earshot and called you an adulterer and called me an adulteress. You let somebody speak to you like that? Herodias was a woman who was after power. She found that power in Herod that she would not find in her rightful husband, husband Philip. So, to, to silence John and to, to appease, he thought, Herodias, he has John bound in prison to honor his new bride. His new bride comes with, he has an instant family, she comes with a daughter. Josephus, the historian, says her name was Salome, S-A-L-O-M-E. We're not told that in the gospel accounts, but that comes from extra biblical accounts, Salome. What was John's crime? He told the truth. Verse 18, John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him, and she wanted to put him to death. But she didn't have that power, that authority. Herod didn't do it, not because he didn't want to. Matthew tells us he wanted to, but Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. He, he, recognized, he may not have appreciated what he said about their marriage, but he recognized the character of John. That's important, folks. There will be times when you and I have to say things that are not popular. Pray to God that our lives reflect a character, have a track record of character, so that people may find themselves perplexed with mixed emotions. Well, I don't appreciate what he said about this, but, but, but I've heard about his life. I've had an opportunity to observe some of his life. He, and there are things that I've heard him say that are... That are gladness to my ears. We're not told what those things were, but so Herod putting him in prison, verse 20 says, was to keep him safe. And when Herod heard him, he was perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. I was in a place for nine years where folks didn't want to hear some of the things we had to say from the scriptures about adultery and fornication, immorality, and a church acting like the church at Corinth, winking at it rather than dealing with it. And there was some real unpopularity there toward me. I'm not going to go into a long detail of stories, but, but there are two snapshots that I remember distinctly that that I hope will let you kind of move, feel this tension here. This He was perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. A young lady was brought to me by her sister. She was near a nervous breakdown, it seemed to me. We tried to console her, read the scripture to her, pray with her, hear her. And in hearing her, learned that 
that she was involved in a relationship in college. She, was, she had a young man living with her and knew it was wrong, but was, had tension there. Didn't know what to do. We tried to love her and we gave her some good sound advice and encouraged her to, encourage, to ask the man, insist on the man, young man move out of her apartment. It was her apartment. And so she came to see me again and was listening. It was clear that she was listening. She liked what I had to say, wanted to know more. And one day he came with her. If I had had a movie camera running behind me, I would love to have that footage today. She was just so leaning forward, enthralled. She had her Bible with her. He was sitting next to her, arms folded, sighing deeply. The Lord saved that young woman. It was remarkable. Now, a little story on her. Her mother had died tragically and so, uh, several years ago, and so I had gone out to, to the family to pay a call to them. They had connections in our church. And she met me in the driveway, the same young woman. She said, what the blankety blank are you doing here? Nobody wants you here. Get the blank out of here. Now, I've, I've been unwelcome at places before, but that was a pretty shocking unwelcome. So here she is now in my office sometime later. The Lord saves her. The boyfriend keeps coming. The Lord saves him. I had the privilege in the, for over a period of time to counsel and marry them. And saw them and went back for the uh, 175th anniversary. He's a deacon in the church there. They have a precious family. So I understand this. And she would, she apologized over and over. I said, it's okay. It's okay. You weren't then where you are now. Don't worry about that. Another couple, an older couple, had marital problems. Marital, it was common in the community. They had marital problems. People thought they were going to break up. And so one, one morning, early in the morning, I was in my study. I don't think it was even daylight yet. And this knock comes on my study door. The study was attached at the end of the house. And open door and there's this fellow standing there. And he said, I knew him, knew of him. He said, can we talk? I said, yeah. And I brought him in. He said, you know, there's a lot of my relatives and friends that don't like you. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I knew that. I didn't need him to tell me that at daylight. He said, but what I know is this. You'll tell me the truth. And so we began to meet with him, and his wife came along at one point, and, and they got back together, had a wonderfully budding marriage. What's the point here? We must speak truth to people, truth in love, and know that they may not receive it. But they're the ones who have the perplexity, not us. And there are those things, if we'll stay faithful and, and uh, humble and work on our character as we reach out to others, that there will be those times when they hear us gladly, even if they're perplexed about some of the things. I mean, think of some of the positions we must take in this day and time. We must stand firmly on being pro-life believers. We're, we're not anti-choice. We, we, we emphasize the nobler choices. I saw a beautiful graphic the other day. It was the word abortion. And B-O-R had been slashed through. And D-O-P had been placed up above it. Adoption. We just believe in the noble choices. The choice to give birth. The choice to let the child be adopted. The choice to raise the child. We have more choices on our plate than the pro-choice movement does. And the whole issue of marriage. We're standing against the culture in both of these things. We're standing against legal authority in both of these things. We've, we've got to be willing to speak the truth and bear the consequences. John was. So this is Herod's dilemma. Finally, I want you to see that Herod allowed himself to be tricked into executing John. It's, it's really a lesson in not making rash judgments, not making rash promises. Look at verses 21 to 29. What's happening there? 
An opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles. So it's his high-ranking people within his own administration. Military commanders, these brigadier generals uh, of, of the Roman army. And other leading men of Galilee. This is a, this is a gathering, a banquet of many top officials. Started in the evening, went late into the night. Herodias' daughter came in and danced. We could talk a lot about that, but I mean, the, the long and short of it is, she must have been really good looking and must have been an incredible dancer, but that, that in and of itself is not, should not be enough to sway us. We must guard our hearts against, against lust of all kinds, the lust of the flesh. Sadly, too many men do not do that. There's, a, there's an epidemic of men who, if not addicted to, uh, frequent or visit occasionally uh, pornography sites on the web. And sadly, you don't have to go looking for some of them. It's a call to guard our hearts. This young lady danced. We're told in verse 22, she pleased Herod and his guests. And you can imagine, it was probably one of those little veil dances with the, the little clipper thing is making noises and she's probably doing kind of a belly dance thing around the room and all this. Probably. I thought was, hopefully that's all it was. But the king and the guest, as they're consuming wine, are pleased. They've had a, they've had their, they're getting their bellies filled, they're getting their, their uh, appetites for wine filled, they're getting their, uh, this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, they're getting their eyes filled. It's a gay old time. It draws later and later. And the king says to her, unsolicited, there's no, there's no indication that she says, I'll dance for you if you'll, if you'll promise to do something for me. Folks, parenthetically, don't let anyone ever put you in that bind. I'll do such and such if you'll promise to do something for me. Well, what is that something? Well, I can't tell you. Uh, count me out. Count me out. <laughs> it's a matter of light and darkness. If we have to hide our ideas in the darkness, they're not worth pursuing. They come to the light. So, whatever you wish, I'll give it to you. And then he, he kind of wants to put a limit, a parameter, up to half my kingdom. You may not remember, but uh, the Persian king who took Esther in said the same thing to her. I'll give you anything you want, up to half of the kingdom. It was his to give, by the way. I don't know what she would have done with it. It shows you that the man has lost some of his sensibilities. He's, we, we would believe it, intoxicated on wine. He's, he's not, he doesn't have his, all his thinking apparatus in place. So she runs to mama and says, what should I ask for? And her mother didn't even hesitate. This is a woman who, while John has been, quote, protected in prison, she's been seething to see him executed. Because as long as he lives, her relationship to Herod is, has a question mark over it. So without hesitation, she says, the head of John the Baptist. She came in immediately with haste to the king and said, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. All these fine platters of food and dainties that we've eaten here tonight. I want the head of John the Baptist on one of those. And the king was exceedingly sorry. He let himself be manipulated, trapped, tricked. When he should have known better if he'd kept his senses about him. But because of his oaths, and his guest, don't he, he made this promise in the presence of, of his noblemen, the, his, his advisors in his administration. He made it in the presence of brigadier generals of the Roman army. He made it in the presence of the leading 
men of the community, he would look weak in his mind if he changed his mind. Isn't it tragic? It's, and you know this, you've seen this, where people will make rash promises of the most awful sort and go through with them in the name of, well, I want to be true to my word. And yet when it comes to, to noble things, they don't have a problem at all with breaking their word, changing their mind. It's, it's, one, of those, it's one of those strange things about some folks. And we see this in Herod. He was sorry. He did not want to break his word to her in, in the presence of all of them. And so he sent immediately the executioner. Bring John's head. He went and there's a, the prison where it's, it's believed that John was being held was not far from uh, this banquet area. So it didn't take long. One of the writers reading said, you know, it's late at night, maybe even going early into the morning. John is asleep, no doubt. He's resting. To be suddenly waked up, brought out of the, of the cell, and have an axe laid to your neck. I mean, how, how shocking, how brutal, how traumatic that was. The executioner brings the head as requested on a platter, hands it to the teenage girl who hands it to her mother. Then just like that, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths for him. The voice who said, there's one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to latch or unlatch. The one who said, behold the Lamb of God when Jesus came on the shore there, who takes away the sin of the world. The one who had not shied back to speak to the Pharisaic leaders when they came down to the river to ask him, what are you doing? He called them vipers. The fearless John the Baptist beheaded suddenly. And our text tells us in verse 29 that when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body. His body. Not his head. They took his headless body and laid him in a tomb. What do we need to know from this? Well, when we speak of the martyrs of the Christian church, we typically speak of Stephen and of James as being the, the first martyr. Stephen stoned to death, James beheaded in the, in the aftermath of Pentecost, and that's true. But really we need to recognize that John the Baptist was the first person close to Jesus to be martyred for his convictions. We need to know that. Chronologically, historically, that's simply accurate. We need to feel some things too. We need to feel as we, as we read of this, a willingness to speak the truth and a commitment to follow Jesus, knowing that it may cost everything you and I have. Now, it costs very little right now for us. Yeah, there's some laws being considered and, and we read about crazy things happening in, in school situations. The Bible's not allowed, but children are encouraged to know the five pillars of Islam. And traditional marriage is looked down upon, but it's okay to read about how, how Tommy had two daddies. And we, those things have been happening all around us. And the outcries of folks wanting to bring Sharia law into play and, and states vote that down overwhelmingly, 80, 90 percent, and then judges say, well, that's not, that's not constitutional. You've got to consider the rights. And you, all these things happening around us. It's, we're not being stoned. We're not being beheaded. We're not being thrown into prison for being Christians yet. But the last six years in this country, and I'm not, I'm not glamorizing or glorifying the, the previous eight and the eight before that. But the last six years in this country 
have been an occasion for America to turn its principles upside down to such an extent that you've got to understand that if we do not live ourselves to see the level of persecution brought to John and to others in that day and the level of persecution being brought to many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, we ought to recognize it's coming to us. It's coming here. Everybody, they're all, they're all coming out of the closet. Uh, boldly, brashly declaring their lifestyle, their beliefs, their attitude toward life and death with, without any seeming moral harness. You read today of articles and videos posted Women saying, I've, I'm so grateful for my abortion. The, the things that my abortion did for me, I'm a, I'm a new woman. I'm a, and you're going... Spokesman for Islam on our networks saying without hesitation, we want all of America to be under Sharia law and won't be satisfied until that's the case. Not some fellow standing out in the sand somewhere Kyr or one of these groups without even batting an eye. So we've got to understand. We've got to feel a grip, a willingness to be ready to speak the truth in love and committed to follow Jesus wherever that may take us because it may cost us everything. And that's what Jesus was saying. When you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, the instrument of death. Be sure that you have handy with you Something for them to impale you on when they rise to hate you enough that they want to get rid of you. Take up your cross and follow me. And so I think we have to count the cost of following Jesus. I'm, I, I really am concerned for some of these uh, mega churches that when it gets to this level, there'll be a great falling away. People and members of churches that are full service churches that they provide everything they need you know, all gyms and malls and all this kind of, that they'll fall away. That's not what they signed up for. They didn't, they didn't sign up to be beheaded. They didn't sign up to be crucified. They didn't sign up to be shot. Did not sign up to be hanged. Didn't sign up to go to prison. Didn't sign up to have all their possessions taken from them. But you know what? Everywhere else in the world, that's what people sign up for. My friend R.F. Gates was in the Ukraine uh, many years ago now. He was preaching there and he said we had a, they had a baptism service at that afternoon, early evening, by a lake. He said all the congregation showed up out there and there were about eight or ten adults, made commitments to Christ, ready to be baptized. He said, he said, I had a translator standing next to me. He said the pastor walked up to each one of them, looked in their face and exhorted them. He said, well, earnestly. He said, whatever he was saying, he was saying it with passion. And I said, what's going on? I said, well, he's telling each one of them that they need to understand that to publicly commit themselves to Christ is to put a death sentence on their lives. They've got to be ready to die. And they need to know that before they go into the waters of baptism that they will probably be killed at some point because they're Christians. And he, do you want that? Are you willing to go for that? Are you willing to step into these waters knowing that following Jesus, being identified with Jesus may cost you your very life and everything you have? And you say, if you don't, go, turn around and go away. No hard feelings. And one by one, they stepped into the water. And I remember Gatana Gatana, when he was here with us, talking about, I think it was in Nigeria, where some people had committed themselves to Christ, and they had a baptism in a body of water at night, out of view of the, of the Russian authorities at the time. Maybe in Ethiopia. As they were having their ceremony, their service, men on horses rode up. And as they were coming up out of the water, the men on horses, remember the story Gatana told us? Said to them, renounce Jesus Christ now. They said no. And they shot them in the water or at the foot of the water, at the edge of the water, 
where they stood. Because they'd identified with Christ. We've got to count the cost of following Jesus. The darkness is quickly falling on this culture. It may not hit someone of my age. It may not hit someone of your age. Brothers and sisters, look at our sons and our daughters and our grandsons and our granddaughters. We have got to be telling them this truth. 10, 15, 20 years ago, I felt as passionate about that, but it seemed at a distance. And yet today, 2015, when brothers and sisters in Christ are being slaughtered all around this globe simply for being Christians, not because they're doing any harm to anybody. The, the Christians in Mexico are not, they're not out hunting down the cartels and killing them. They're simply living as Christians. They're an enemy to the cartels. Our brothers, brothers and sisters, our sons, our daughters, our grandsons, our granddaughters have got to be taught that following Christ may cost them everything they have, everything they are. It may cost them their lives. That's what the message of the death of John the Baptist tells us. He spoke truth to power. There was a day in this country when, when the news media was supposed to speak truth to power. That's long gone. The news media in this country is, is a tool of propaganda for the current regime. Someone's got to rise and speak truth to power. Not be mean, belligerent, speak the truth in love, but speak the truth nonetheless. And I think that's what God calls us to be. This is why John, why Mark takes the time to say, well, I need to tell you about, if you didn't know, you need to know about John. What happened to John? Why it happened to John? He was identified as someone who knew Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, and he would say it to us today, remember, when the world hates you, it hated me first. No servant will be above his master. Words we need to take to heart today. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, sinless life, death on our behalf, Bloody, ugly, cruel death on the cross and yet dying there, satisfying the divine wrath of God, satisfying his divine justice by suffering and dying in our place and rising from the grave three days later so that we, if we face death in this way, need not fear death. In fact, for Christ's followers, any way that we face death, we will not fear. For you are with me, God. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You've sent the great shepherd before me. And as one of his lambs, who knows his voice, will run to him when he calls, my good shepherd will lead me safely through. Do you know Jesus Christ here today? Rejoice. You need to know him. Understand, salvation by grace through faith is free. Being a Christian may cost you everything. Let's pray.